From the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, this is Road to Resilience, a podcast about facing adversity. I'm John Earl. My guest today is Dr. Rafael Paleo. He's a clinical professor at the Stanford University School of Medicine in the Division of Sleep Medicine. He is also the author of the new book, How to Sleep, The New Science-Based Solutions for Sleeping Through the Night. Poor sleep is associated with everything from obesity to depression, and it makes us less resilient. A 2016 study found that insomniacs in the military were sicker and less fit for service than the good sleepers. So it's no surprise that the U.S. Army Surgeon General put sleep up there with nutrition and physical activity as being the keys to good health. And so, the age-old question, how do we get better sleep? Maybe sleep hygiene? Well, it turns out it's both simpler and more complicated than that. And Dr. Paleo covers all of that in our conversation And he answers some of my burning questions, like about napping and blue lights and lucid dreaming. Plus, he talks about the dream chambers of ancient Egypt, which is so weird and so cool. You're going to want to hear that. So here's my conversation with Dr. Rafael Paleo. I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Paleo, welcome to Word Resilience. Thank you so much for having me. In your book, you write about an epidemic of sleep deprivation, and you say it's getting worse. Can you help us to wrap our minds around the scale of the problem, the cost to society, and what's to blame? Let's work backwards. The blame is the fact that we've made sleep an inconvenience more than a priority. We've got to think of sleep as a biological necessity. And lately, the way I've been describing it to people, it's the ultimate form of self-care. It's how the body really heals, the brain really heals itself. But we're not fragile creatures. There, there's a robustness to our sleep system, so it allows us to have some flexibility. We can sleep more, sleep less under certain circumstances. But because we have this flexibility built into our system, people early on learn that they can get by with less sleep. But you're getting by, you're not at your best, but you're just getting by, but you can get by with less sleep. And that leads to a cultural trend of getting by as little sleep as possible. Is there any sense that sleep deprivation as a societal problem is getting worse? It's been looked at by different ways, different ways of measuring it, but the answer is yes, it is getting worse uh, in the sense that people are getting less and less sleep over time. The Center for Disease Control has been tracking sleep in teenagers, and they have found over the past 20 years, there's been a tendency to get less and less sleep among teenagers. And in fact, teenage girls are very sleep deprived. About 75% of them aren't getting enough sleep. So any of you that work with teenagers, have teenagers in any way interacting in their lives, as educators, as parents, anybody who interacts with teenagers, just know in general you're dealing with a sleep-deprived population. And when people are sleep-deprived, the first signs of sleep deprivation are people being inattentive and grumpy, irritable. So if you know any <laughs> grumpy teenagers, you know that they're not getting enough sleep. That's what's happening to them. Sleep problems in general are linked to so many diseases. I'm not going to list them all off. There's a lot. Mm-hmm. This is a time of pandemic. It's particularly important to have a strong immune system and insomnia works against a strong immune system. Can you explain how? So what happens is that lack of sleep is viewed as uh, by our system as a stressor. And stress creates an inflammatory reaction. So already lack of sleep is prime the system, like something is wrong. And it could be simply that you want to stay up and watch a movie, but to the brain, something is wrong. You're not getting sleep. Why would you be doing this? So lack of sleep prompts an inflammatory reaction, a low-grade inflammation. So if you already have a low-grade inflammation going through your system, you add on top an acute infection, you can overwhelm the system. So they've actually done these experiments well before we knew about the the current pandemic, which has been horrible. Um, They had volunteers. Imagine who would volunteer to do this. Probably college students. People (laughs) volunteered to to get a cold, to have the rhinovirus injected into their noses. And they had two groups. One group sleep deprived, the other one that was not sleep deprived. And of course, as you'd expect, the, the group that was sleep deprived got more cold systems and had more likely to get the cold with a lower viral load. So the explanation of the how, which is what you ask, is thought to be that chronic sleep is already a stressor to the system as an inflammatory reaction and that you're adding something on top of it. The other way to think about this, though, is sleep deprived animals die of sepsis. And what happens is we really are multiple organisms inside of us, right? We're, we're, you're one individual, but we cannot exist without a whole bunch of other bacteria living inside of us. We need these bacteria. So we have a symbiotic relationship with these bacteria. Well, when we're not getting enough sleep, the bacteria somehow, maybe it's evolution, somehow know something's wrong with this particular host. He's not getting sleep. And what attacks us is our own gut bacteria. 
the, the gut gets leaky. We actually are attacked not by outside infections necessarily. They can attack us too. But our own buddies, our friends, our friendly gut bacteria will also attack us. And that's how we can get septic. So I think it's, it's almost like the bacteria saying, we got to get out of this body because this guy's not getting enough sleep. That's how I think of it. I also came across a study um, from 2016 that linked insomnia to less resilience. This was a study of military service members. Um, and they found that the insomniacs had lower self-rated health, more lost work days, higher odds of early discharge from the military, and they needed more health care. I don't think any of this will surprise you. Yeah, think, think about what it's like to live your life with chronic insomnia. And let's, we should define insomnia just be, to, to me so all, all the listeners are on the same page. Insomnia is trouble falling asleep or staying asleep to the point that bothers you the next day. Trouble falling asleep or trouble staying asleep to the point that bothers you the next day. Chronic insomnia, by the way, is defined as having insomnia for just three months. We typically see people with years, decades of poor sleep. Just three months is enough because once you've slept poorly for three months, you start to anticipate sleeping poorly. You don't look forward to going to sleep. Think about what that's like. You have to sleep every single night. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, tomorrow depends on how will I sleep tonight. I got a big day tomorrow. Tomorrow's an important day. I have to get my sleep. How do I know what kind of day I want to have tomorrow? Depends on how I sleep. How do I know how I'm going to sleep unless I sleep lightly to monitor my sleep? Because how else am I going to know? So the fact that you're trying to predict tomorrow makes you sleep even lighter because you're trying to anticipate what's happening. And it's every single night, night after night. How bad will it be tonight? Um, I'm single. I have a new bed partner. What's this person going to think of me if they know that I'm kind of weird and they can't sleep? Are they going to think it's strange of me to do this? How do I let them know this? Or what if I move it and disturb their sleep? Or what if my significant other has insomnia and I'm, the, and I'm the good sleeper? What do I do to make them sleep better? So you can see how this wears on people's minds every single night. It sounds like an anxiety disorder. It's, it's a focused anxiety about sleeping. It, that's what it is. And that's how we approach it. And the way you know you have this pattern is, for example, if you find yourself that you're drowsy or sleepy in some other part of your home, in the living room, and you're yawning, and but as soon as you get, get to bed, as soon as your head hits the pillow, you're wide awake. The thought of sleeping will wake you up. And people with insomnia have certain behaviors that, that, that demonstrate this. For example, people with insomnia often sleep better away from home. Most of us sleep better in our own homes because the bedroom should be a sanctuary. But if you sleep better away from your home, something's up. Because again, they create negative associations. Sleeping has become a time of uncertainty, time of torture. And they associate that with their bedrooms. You know, this happens in the sleep lab. We're putting wires on people's heads, face, toes, chest. We're putting, they're wired up completely. We have cameras on them and a stranger's watching them sleep. And under those circumstances, most people would have trouble sleeping with all these wires, instrumentation, and, and the cameras. But the insomniacs often say that they slept better in the sleep lab than they do at home, and they ask about our mattresses. They want to, they want to know what brand mattresses we have because they think it's the mattress. It's not the mattress. I had a guest on recently who's a paleoanthropologist, and he shared um, some examples of what to us seem like weird sleeping arrangements that he's encountered um, and his point was there are lots of different ways that humans have adapted to sleep. And so this idea of the perfect way to sleep, this gets into those sleep rules, um, is is seriously suspect. And so the first thing I want to ask you is, do you have an example of a sleeping arrangement that is normal for some people and may seem very strange to us? There's so many of them. For a long time, people have viewed this for antiquity that the gods were sending us messages in our dreams. So if you were in the uh, dream interpretation business or if you were in the divining business, if you were a, uh, a cleric, you needed to um, provide dreams to interpret and get, tell people and get visions. So the more uncomfortable you are, the more likely you are to remember your dreams. So in ancient Egypt, they had a dream chamber, sleeping chambers for the people, uh, whatever the right term is, for, for, for the clerics. And if you look at how they slept, it didn't look too comfortable. But it makes a lot of sense because you only remember dreams if you wake up during a dream. So if I can make you a little bit, un a little bit uncomfortable, you know, like a little pebble under your mattress kind of thing. If I can disturb you dreaming just a little bit, you're more likely to report more dreams. There's another example I think um, it, that's interesting is going to prehistoric tribes that they notice that people are waking up throughout the night all the time. If if sleep isn't the most dangerous thing we do as animals, then we have to protect ourselves while we're sleeping. Then periodically in a tribe of people waking up at different times, we will look at each other's safety. And when women go through menopause, they sleep, typically sleep very poorly. Menopause is characterized by very fragmented sleep, hot flashes, for example. 
You say, well, why is that happening? You know, if we were in this purely animalistic way thinking, well, if a woman's gone through menopause, then she cannot reproduce, then why is she there? What's the value to society, right? Which is a horrible way of thinking about it. But in reality, there's an argument that says that as uh, women go through menopause, they become more protective of the group because their sleep is more fragmented. So just like we have teenagers who sleep very deeply, and it's hard to wake up a sleeping teenager. So you have this young group of people who are biologically designed to shift to sleep late at night. They sleep later so they can watch over the fire at one point. Then you have another group in the tribe that has this choppy sleep. And overall, the society works well for us, even though the individual person may be suffering from their sleep. As a group, you see how collectively it, it, it protects us. So there are a lot of examples of that. And, and, and uh, I like this topic of paleontology and, and, and how we evolved in anthropology of sleep in general. Let's take on the sleep rules. Go. Cool. So the old sleep rules that everybody has heard, don't read in bed, don't drink alcohol before bedtime, those sorts of things that have been in place for many decades at this point, you're skeptical of them. You cite research that says that they're not even that effective, really. Um, what's yeah. wrong with the rules? The, the sleep hygiene rules have become too successful. They've been too popular. They're good rules for everybody in general. But the reality is when you deal with patients which is different. Most people don't have sleep disorders. Most people sleep just fine. The sleep hygiene rules make sense for them. But when you're dealing with patients, things are different because the more logical you are, the more uh, c- common sense you apply, the more analytical you are to a sleep problem, the more like you are to screw it up because the correct approach is counterintuitive. Uh, we're, this is an audio podcast, folks, but uh, but I can see my host. I see John and he's just <laughs> wincing at me. I see him on, the, on camera. He's wincing when I said that. The right approach to most sleep problems is counterintuitive. For example, it's logical. If I can't sleep, I should lay in bed and rest. That makes complete sense. But what you're really doing then is getting your body used to being awake in bed. And you're creating an association with being awake and frustrated in bed. So the more time you spend in bed, your body then reacts by sleeping even lighter. And the insomnia gets worse. Logic is, if I can't sleep, I should go do something. What could be more logical? I can't sleep, I should go check my email. I can't sleep, I should get something done. I should go do do some chore. Well, what did you just do by doing that? You just rewarded the insomnia by getting something accomplished. So you don't want to do that. So typically most insomniacs are being driven to their insomnia by uh, maladaptive thinking, misconceptions about sleep. And the reason the sleep hygiene rules are important to point, uh, point this out is because when people have sleep disorders, they already try the sleep hygiene things in advance and don't work for them. So there is no data that sleep hygiene by itself helps people with sleep disorders sleep better. It doesn't work that way. Is there a single piece of advice that you find yourself giving the most often? So uh, different tips for, for helping sleep. Um, the first thing is to lock in a wake-up time. People often focus on the falling asleep, but it's easier to force you to wake up to fall asleep. So I really like locking in the wake-up time first. I like people to do something they enjoy first thing in the morning. Do something that's fun. You shouldn't be dreading your day. People who are like, ah, oh, you know, they, they, they're unhappy with things. I go, what do you like to do? Even I have teenagers that come to go play video games first thing in the morning. Parents don't want to take away the video games. I'm like, well, play first thing in the morning. You know, and it gets you bright light in your eyes, something you enjoy. People want to play musical instruments. A lot of things people can do if they can. They can try to accommodate and put it and put it to good use. I had a painter who was having trouble sleeping. I said, can you start painting some sunrises? Start painting sunrises and sleep gets better because you know she has a, something she enjoys first thing in the morning. I always tell people uh, um, sleeping should be silent, right? You should not snore. Your sleeping should be refreshing. You should not wake up tired. You don't leave restaurants feeling hungry. You should not wake up feeling tired. So that's those are some of the key concepts for me. There's more to it than that. If you wake up tired, no matter how much sleep you get, though, if you're always tired, no matter how much sleep you get, then you definitely want a sleep test. You have a great, I think it's the first line of your book. It has, it's something to the effect of we've been sleeping longer than we've been breathing. Do yeah. I have it right? What is it? Yeah. Um, if, if you think it was kind of weird, because I'm a sleep doctor, right? And, and, and whether, whether we even need sleep doctors, because you've been sleeping longer. It's one of the oldest things we've ever done, because you were sleeping in utero, which means that we were sleeping before we ever took our first breath of oxygen. We were, we were sleeping long before we ever had our first bite of food. So, so, so that's how long we've been sleeping for, and that's how long it's been built in. We're sleeping in utero. In fact, we're in utero. Um, we have more dreaming time than practically um, any other activity we do. About half of our time in utero is dreaming. And what are they dreaming about? Who knows? But uh, I remember the first time I gave a talk on, on on this topic when I came. I'm from New York City, and I came from the Bronx. Um, when I got to California, the first time I gave a lecture, 
And I mentioned that babies are dreaming a lot and you don't know what they're dreaming about. Some lady raised her hand in the back of the room and said, well, they're dreaming about their past lives. And I'm like, okay, that, I'm in California now. You can't argue against it. There's, there's, there's no empirical science saying you, you, that they're wrong or they're right. But, the, but that's the point, that we have all this activity of dreaming and sleeping going on, which lets you know how foundationally important it is um, for us to, to do this. So, yeah, we've been sleeping long, longer than ever. The other uh, quote in the book, in the beginning of the book, I quote uh, another sleep scientist who said, if sleep has no function, it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made. Right? Because it is a really weird thing to do. So logic would be for us not to sleep at all. Logic, if you were to design it, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley right now. There's a bunch of meetings going on all around me, I'm sure, people trying to raise money for different ideas. There's not a single person meeting to come up with an idea for a robot that sleeps more. Nobody wants a sleeping robot, right? It's, it's gonna actually, there's no value to it. However, there's some data from artificial intelligence um, work that if you make an artificial intelligence machine have dreaming properties to it, they actually become more efficient. And they incorporate dream theory into artificial intelligence and the machines work better. So there's, there's stuff to this. There's a reason we ended up doing it this way. All right, so I wanna end with a rapid fire round in the spirit of your okay. book, which has sure. a Q and A section. Lucid dreaming, is it a real thing? Can you do it? Should somebody try? Yes, lucid dreaming is a real thing. People who've had the experience don't doubt it. People who've never done it, oh, question it. If you've ever been able to manipulate a dream during a dream, you know it's real and you, you won't forget it. Can you do it? I did it. Uh, that's actually how I got into sleep originally. When I was 12 years old. I, I had a lucid dream. And that kind of sparked my curiosity about why we dream. As I've gotten older, I've not been able to do it. But I know plenty of people who do it. And it is a learned skill. But young people tend to just do it. So I, I've had that experience. And it, I, and it sounds from your question, John, you've never done it. I you, have. When I was a kid, I used to be able to do it. I can't do it anymore. So it's a real thing then. Yeah, you remember what you did. The most common thing people do is fly when they I remember have a lucid dream. it being a lot of fun. Yeah. But I know it has, it has kind of an aura of being potentially very profound. It can be mystical for some people. Uh, I, I met one man who's trained himself to do it, who decided to Im imagine his death and, and visit his own funeral. And he was in tears when he woke up, but he, but he thought it was a profound moment in his life because he had some insights into what's happening. Um, it's a pretty much of a hybrid state because the, when they look at fMRI data, the, the, the brain is not in the same way typically as when it's asleep or when it's awake. It's a hybrid state where you're getting more blood flow to the, to the, usually when we're dreaming, the associative cortex has more blood flow and there's less, less blood flow, less activity in the frontal lobes, or executive functions. That's why we don't question reality in our dreams. But in, in, the, um, hybrid, in the lucid dreaming state, there is more activity in the frontal lobe than you typically see in dreaming sleep. Question two, naps, good or bad? It's like saying a snacking, good or bad. Yes, I think naps can be very good if you are um, not getting enough sleep. But if you're somebody who does not sleep well at night, then just like if you won't eat your dinner because you're snacking before dinner is bad, napping then is going to interfere. But we all visit people's homes that we don't want to eat at their house. We don't trust their food there. So having a snack before you get there make, it helps you not show up hungry at somebody's house. So, so naps are just that. They, they really are like snacking. And they can be good or bad depending on how you use them. Should I get a new mattress? Well, you know, the mattress is interesting um, because mattresses gain weight over time. Your mattress is heavier now than when you first bought it. If you buy a new mattress, I'd advise you never to buy a used mattress. Only get a new one. If you want a new, it's a luxury. And as people have more disposable income, mattresses have become higher end. And there's te technology in mattresses. I just got a new mattress. So it, it can be fun to get a new mattress. But you only need a, a mattress if something is wrong. When we're little kids, you slept anywhere. When you were five or six years old, you had a sleepover. You sleep on, you, you'd beg to sleep on the floor of your friend's house, right? And you're teenagers, you crash on their couch. You, the sleeping surfaces only really matter as you get older for a lot of people. I have a feature on my phone that turns down the blue light yeah. in the evening. Is that a real thing that's useful or is that a bunch of nonsense? I think of the blue light filters as putting like filters on cigarettes. The issue is... What's keeping you awake is not necessarily the blue light. It's the content of the information that you're obtaining, the fact that you're not making sleep a priority. That's the bigger problem. So the, so our brains are cued into blue light for circadian shifts, but it's not the only reason we stay awake. We'll stay awake because the content of the information we're receiving. You, you could lose sleep reading a, a good book, right? So it's not just the light, but it's also the content that you're receiving. So yeah, it, it, it helps, but it's not the whole, whole picture. Is there an ideal number of hours that someone should aim for? 
The National Sleep Foundation recommends seven to nine hours of sleep, and there's a range. And I think if you talk to anybody about their sleep needs or sleep desires, they'll give you two numbers. Right now, you might say, I'd like to get eight, but I can get by with six. And if your friends, and they'll tell you that they sleep more in, in Alaska in the winter than during the summer. So some seasonal, seasonal variability to, to our ability and a need for sleep. But in general, what you want to do is wake up feeling refreshed. That's what you want. And that's what you're going to know. You should wake up feeling refreshed. You know you're not getting enough sleep if you tend to sleep in on weekends a lot, right? Because why would you need to catch up on sleep if you're getting all the sleep you need? So seven to nine hours is the, is the number to shoot for. I get about seven and a half has, has been my, my trend. Can you get by with less sleep? <laughs> you can get by with less sleep, but you're not at your best. Of course you can get by with less sleep. Every physician, we we're forced to get by with less sleep. But is that the point of life is to get by, right? You're not at your best, right? So yes, you, you want to be your best self. You want to get more sleep. But yes, you can get by with less sleep. But you're going to pay the price. You may be inattentive. You may be getting car accidents. You may kill somebody in your car because you fell asleep at the wheel and you took somebody out when you did that. So be careful. And lastly, what do you recommend to somebody who often wakes up tired? What should they do? I tell anybody who's not, not satisfied with their sleep to seek out a board-certified sleep doctor. Modern sleep medicine has reached a point where it's unusual for patients not to improve. So if you're tired, no matter how much sleep you get, insist that your doctor have you see a certified sleep doctor. Not just get a sleep study, but get a sleep history. Get evaluated properly. If somebody takes time and talks to you and does a full consultation, because you should not be waking up tired at all. Thank you so much, Dr. Palaio. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rafael Palaio is a clinical professor at the Stanford University School of Medicine in the Division of Sleep Medicine. His new book is How to Sleep, The New Science-Based Solutions for Sleeping Through the Night. That's all for this episode of Road to Resilience. We are a production of the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. The podcast is made by Nikki Cheatham, me, John Earl, and our sleep-savvy executive producer, Lucia Lee. From all of us here, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.